chapter, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone who's here for, um, I think it's our fourth court um, webinar. And I'm just going to do a real brief introduction. Um, uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Uh, Michael Boniger. He's professor and chair at uh, physical medicine and rehabilitation at University of Pittsburgh Schools of Health Sciences, and also the director of uh, uh, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center's UPMC's Rehabilitation Institute. Um, he's known for his um, extensive research in spinal cord injury, um, assistive technology, and regenerative medicine, to name a few. Um, and for those who may not know, he also works really closely with one of our court alumni, Baby Ambrosio, who's also on uh, the session with us today. So um, he's going to talk about um, this emerging field of regenerative rehab and then also talk about the newly funded Alliance for Regenerative Rehabilitation Research and Training. So Dr. Bonager, take it away. Great, right, thank you. Uh, let me know if at any point you can't hear me, uh, and and I'd welcome interruptions to, to make this as lecture like as as kind of in person like as possible. So um, the the uh, it's it's a pleasure to talk to this group. Uh, um, I think these programs uh, for uh, mentoring uh, junior rehab uh, researchers are fantastic, and I am a really firm believer in the importance of clinical researchers. And so it's a, a, a great group to address. Uh, the opening slide is, is really related to the um, NIH uh, uh, grant that we just got funded, um, which is uh, part of a program to kind of have national centers of excellence that elevate uh, rehabilitation research uh, um, a, really across a, a couple of different domains. And ours is called the Alliance for Regenerative Rehabilitation Research and Training, or um, AR3T. Uh, and you can see our website, and we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit. The, um, uh-oh, advancing slides doesn't seem to be working. Let me, oh, well, there we go. Um, so, uh, I, you know, this is a, a relatively old slide and probably one that's relatively obvious as well um, for all the people on the phone. I, I don't think I have to talk too much about the importance of uh, uh, the, the, the scope of the problem of disability in America. Um, the one in five adults with a disability, many children with a disability. Uh, and so this is a, a huge problem that uh, – um, is uh, leading to increased costs for the healthcare system um, and you know quality of life and many factors that are the reason we all do the rehabilitation research that we do. And with an aging population and trends in the workforce, it's not thought that this problem is gonna get a, go away anytime soon. So uh, there's an urgent need um, for innovative solutions to mitigate disability-related uh, um, costs and uh, to improve the quality of life of people with disabilities. Uh, and, and I think that the, the, the program that you're all a part of and this uh, regenerative rehabilitation center that I get to talk to you about today is are just efforts along these lines. Uh, so what's regenerative rehabilitation? Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, uh, Fabrizio, Dr. Ambrosio as an alum and as one of the people and Dr. Wolf is another are all people who have kind of helped coin this term, uh, Cliff Brubaker, um, uh, but, and then advance this term of regenerative rehabilitation and kind of from a simple perspective, um, a way of thinking about it is um, if you look at regenerative medicine, so the first term is the process of creating living functional tissues to repair or replace tissue or organs function that's lost due to age, disease, damage, or congenital defects. And I think that, you know, for the purpose of uh, rehabilitation in this talk, you know, we're really talking about function. So that, that we're, we're um, you know, a pancreas regeneration is really important to someone's function, but on a medical realm, um, it, it, uh, it's probably something that we get less involved with. Um, the area of rehabilitation medicine or rehabilitation, um, because that can be a loaded term, I'll just say rehabilitation clinicians or therapeutics is, you know, our, our goal as clinicians is to maximize an individual's functional capacity after illness or trauma. And when you combine these two things, um, there's a couple of things that become apparent is that, that there's overlap. Uh, and, and so when we define it, uh, we, and what we believe is that if you integrate these two fields, uh, that they have a chance of 
uh, interacting in a positive way that help our patients. So if you apply regenerative medicine techniques, uh, rehabilitation techniques to regenerative therapies, it'll increase the uh, effectiveness of those regenerative therapies. Uh, and anytime we increase uh, the effectiveness of regenerative therapies, um, we, we can increase, we improve the lives of people with disability. Uh, and so that's kind of the fundamental definition or goal behind regenerative rehabilitation. Uh, you know, two examples of these, which are really both uh, Dr. Ambrosio's work. And so since she's on the call, I don't even know if I can let her explain it or I just need to um, uh, go for her. Um, but interrupt, uh, Fabi, if I get anything wrong. But this really is just showing that, you know, one of the things that I think um, has hampered regenerative medicine research at times is differentiation and incorporation of stem cells or other uh, um, regenerative techniques. And, and so the question is, if you implant a stem cell into a muscle, how does the stem cell, even a muscle derived stem cell, how does it know um, it, what, how to differentiate um, and is there anything that we can do that increases the differentiation of, of, of stem cells into the appropriate lineage? Uh, and so this is a study that, that, that Fabi did looking at um, a clinically relevant dose of electrical stimulation um, uh, as a, a way to enhance the efficacy of uh, implanting stem cells in a muscular dystrophy uh, model of, a uh, mouse model of muscular dystrophy. <laughs> Um, and, and what you can see from the graphs here um, on the left is that um, when you just inject um, uh, saline and there's no uh, um, stem cells injected, um, and you compare then, and, and then this is um, at one week and four weeks, uh, that you see very little um, uh, indications of dystrophin positive and myosin heavy chain uh, um, in the muscles. If you inject the stem cells, um, you see an improvement over the control condition. Uh, um, uh, if, um, if you inject um, just saline, but then you stimulate the muscles, so a therapeutically relevant um, electrical stimulation, uh, you see some change, um, but the greatest change is really um, when you combine these two therapies. So inject stem cells, and then also provide exercise. And what you can see is that um, at one week, there's uh, 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 some impact, but at four weeks, there's this, was there a question? I don't like even know her. I don't know why she's so. I don't think so. <laughs> so although it sounds like an interesting conversation to listen into. <laughs> um, all right. So um, at any rate, uh, if you look down here at four weeks, you can see this large difference um, between these. Uh, that I treated, and she lives on the hall from her. Oh, why don't? All right, so I'll try to talk over to this other person. All right, I'll see if I can find um, the uh, So um, a relatively large effect. Of the stimulation yeah, over just the stem cells derived. Michael, I'm going to interrupt just for a second. So, um, anyone who's just recently joined, um, we are getting some feedback. So, if you have your mic on, you might want to mute it. Um, and if you want to do a question, you can then unmute it. We'll see how that works. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, and 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 then there's just the staining um, slide stainings to further prove this point on the right side, where you can see. Uh, um, uh, uh, much more dystrophin positive uh, uh, cells um, uh, uh, on the right than on the left. Uh, I think that's uh, correct. There's not a screen behind me with this. Uh, another example of this um, is provided by uh, um, just looking at um, another uh, regenerative medicine technique, which is uh, to um, include, uh, implant an extracellular matrix or any type of bioscaffold that leads to ingrowth of, of stem cells and differentiated stem cells. Uh, and um, because of the work that uh, uh, Fabrizia had done, uh, there is a researcher uh, here named Stephen Badlack who worked with an extracellular matrix as a means to replace um, uh, injured muscle. So muscle has some in innate regenerative capacity uh, if, in fact, um, the, the muscle injury is large enough, though, it will not regenerate. Uh, and the thought was that you could actually 
put an extracellular matrix in place and that that might lead to regeneration. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem, didn't seem to work in some initial trials. And what was found was that they would actually put the extracellular matrix in it and then cast the animal that the initial work was done so that they couldn't move for a couple of weeks and then start exercising them. Uh, almost by serendipity, they found out that if they uh, actually exercise the animal quickly after surgery that it had a greater impact. And so what you see here is uh, this is a, um, uh, actually in, in one of our uh, patients. This is a human participant in a study, uh, and we implanted uh, an, an extracellular matrix in this area here. On pretty much day one postoperatively, we start exercising them. So uh, we'll have a therapist uh, visit the patient in the hospital, and we start a prescribed exercise program. And you can actually see here exactly where the muscle regenerated. That regeneration actually led to increased function, and you can see the various parameters for increased function. Uh, that we were able to document postoperatively. Uh, and we've had now a, a case series of uh, um, that, that's over 10 uh, patients uh, and, and published uh, numerous findings from this showing that we're regenerating functional tissue. So those are examples. Um, I'm excited to tell you that there's going to be a lot more examples in the future. Uh, uh, and I can explain that a little bit further as we go along. Um, so why do we need a center of what, what were our arguments um, for a, uh, a, the need for a rehab, a regenerative rehab center? Um, if you look under regenerative medicine and you query NIH reporter where all uh, NIH grants are stored, uh, and it's got a great search function, by the way, so I highly recommend those of you who haven't gone onto this website to get onto the website and play around, see who's doing research in the same areas as you. you. You never know. You might even find people who are at your own institution that are doing this work. Um, if you search regenerative medicine, there's a thousand hits. If you search regenerative medicine and then uh, uh, limit it to rehab departments or other health professions, PT and OT, um, uh, so therapy departments, you get seven hits. Um, and you see that that tends to be dominated uh, at the top there by Fabrizia um, uh, with this grant then being listed next. So if you take out that, you get further down on the list. And I think that, uh-oh. Sorry about that. Um, and, and so the, there, we believe that the field um, would be strengthened if there were a lot more people getting NIH funding and writing NIH grants and doing work in this area. Uh, and, and that there's so much that we have to offer to regenerative medicine and also so much regenerative medicine has to offer to the patients that we treat. So the goal of, uh, of this new center is to establish a national network that will expand scientific knowledge, expertise, and methodologies across the domains of regenerative medicine and rehabilitation. And there's really uh, five aims that were uh, part of this. One is to create educational opportunities. Two is to create collaborative opportunities. Three is to actually provide pilot funding. Um, four is to do uh, technique uh, development. Uh, so that we're actually adding to the science. Uh, and then fifthly, is uh, the last one is really to just make sure we're doing all four of those really well. So we have a, a monitoring place to allow that to happen. This is the leadership. Uh, um, we decided uh, when writing the proposal uh, that uh, the best way to do this would be to bring in some of the strongest people already doing this work and strongest institutions doing this work. Uh, from the very beginning, and Tom Rando, who's a neurologist at Stanford, and I uh, teamed up uh, to um, be co-PIs on the proposal. Uh, he uh, does some amazing rehabilitation uh, research and, and, and uh, regenerative rehabilitation research. Uh, and so, and, and, and I had uh, some of the educational background. The team includes uh, um, Two additional investigators from Pitt, Fabrizia, who you've heard about, uh, Gwen Soa, does biomarker research in low back pain uh, um, and is an MD, PhD. Uh, and then uh, Linda Noble is a, a PT, PhD, who does uh, um, uh, work in the neural re rehabilitation realm. So uh, uh, regenerative rehabilitation can expand past muscles to nerve regeneration and the central nervous system. And Carmen Terzik, who uh, is uh, um, also a physiatrist uh, and does work in cardiac 
uh, rehab. And it's not just that these PIs brought their expertise, but they also brought all the labs of their respective institutions to play. Um, and so if you look at those kind of four areas, uh, we'll just go down of, of our goals. Um, each one of them kind of, we have uh, different levels of commitment and levels of opportunity available. So the first one is educational platforms. And so I uh, like the program we're speaking in, we do quarterly webinars. And as a matter of fact, uh, this webinar is being recorded and this will become the first quarterly webinar for us as well as an introduction to this program. So they'll be free of charge. They'll be posted on our website. Uh, and they will uh, uh, um, and, and cover a broad variety of topics from basic stem cell biology to basic rehabilitation. Not only do we want to attract um, PTs and OTs uh, and, and other clinicians to do regenerative medicine research, but we also want to re attract regenerative medicine people to the rehabilitation realm. Uh, one level up in terms of a quick a, a commitment is uh, massive open online courses or MOOCs, and we'll be putting a MOOC on. Um, and then there's an annual symposium, which we'll talk about in an advanced training course. Uh, um, and obviously, these uh, final two require travel. Um, so uh, you can see here that at Emory University, and let me repeat that, at Emory University, um, with Steve's help, uh, um, we've uh, brought together really what is a, a fantastic uh, program um, for our next regenerative rehabilitation symposium. Um, we have uh, uh, four speakers who uh, um, ha have expertise. Our first speaker, um, uh, um, uh, Mark uh, Tuszynski, um works on neurotrophic factors and axonal growth and cell survival um, in the CNS, uh, um, and he's uh, you know very interested in combination approaches uh, to to be able to cure and treat uh, spinal cord injury uh, and so curative therapies for that. Uh, Ravi, um, uh, I, I think right now is at uh, Georgia Tech, and he's done a lot of work on biomaterials and nanotechnology um, and uh, um, interfacing them with the nervous system uh, as a way to uh, um, enhance nerve repair and, and to create neural interfaces. Uh, and so uh, um, another one of the intersections of these fields. Um, Christina Mummery is uh, uh, her uh, primary interest um, is in using stem cells for cardiovascular disease. And then uh, lastly, Robert Goldberg is uh, um, focused on musculoskeletal growth, uh, functional regeneration following traumatic um, uh, injuries. And so it's going to be a great program. Uh, there are uh, applications being accepted for travel awards uh, um, right now. Uh, and so uh, for those of you who want to have a great trip to uh, Atlanta um, at a, a great time of year to be in Atlanta, um, I'd encourage you to apply. Uh, and again, all of this is available through our website, which I will put back up uh, again uh, at the end of this presentation. Steve, did you want to add anything to that? Did it find I'm, I'm, I'm doing a fine job. It's, you've got it, you got it down perfectly. Thank you. And, and I'm giving Steve a hard time that the, the way, the, the fact of the matter is, is we've, um, we, we held a few of these in Pittsburgh and then what we actually did is we said, we really need host institutions. So Emory has computed as, as contributed intellectual firepower and, and, and finding speakers as well as financially for us to be able to pull this off. And so we're really excited to have their support, which is why uh, I, I'm highlighting that. Uh, um, the, uh, um, and also, who's, the, the other support from this comes from art. It comes from uh, the Palo Alto uh, VA and the University of Pittsburgh, which is why they're at the bottom of the screen. Uh, um, the, the next thing, the, you know, one level further commitment is kind of an introductory course to the concept of uh, regenerative medicine. Um, this is a, a week-long seminar uh, that uh, will bring people in, actually have some lab techniques, have some other uh, aspects of this that are um, to, to help people kind of get that initial exposure to this. And so once again, uh, we'd invite everybody who's on the call if they wanted to, uh, especially the trainees, uh, if they wanted to take part in this, we actually still have slots available 
um, and a, a, a significant amount of funding is provided by the grant. Our speaker is Dr. Ingber, who has had made major contributions to cell biology, mechanobiology, bioengineering, tissue engineering, um, and is really uh, a pioneer award uh, um, uh, recipient and our lecturer, and, and he's going to um, uh, be fantastic. He'll be speaking on Friday night um, at, at that seminar. So again, I encourage applications for that. Um, and then uh, I guess we went a little bit out of order, but we'll have a massive online course available. Um, we're starting to record those and we anticipate that'll come out in the fall. Uh, and these will be uh, um, uh, uh, part of a Coursera website. And so we're excited to put that out there. We did look at Coursera right now, and there's not a lot on regenerative medicine or regenerative rehabilitation. And so we're excited to add to that, uh, um, uh, to that uh, body of information available on the web. So one other area was uh, collaboration. Uh, and, you know, really this is a, a, a way of sharing information and sharing knowledge. And so we created kind of three levels for this as well as part of, of ART3. And so one of them is a phone consultation. If you have an AIMS page that's in the regenerative rehabilitation domain, we'll provide free consultation on your AIMS page. You send us the AIMS page, there's an application available on the website. Um, and you get to, we will match you with the right investigator, and I'll go into that a little bit further later. Uh, and um, they will go over your AIMS page and, you know, spend a little bit of time um, with you uh, discussing what it is that you want to do. Um, um, uh, they'll go through your grant methodology and they'll do this review. And, and just so that you're aware, um, it's free of charge to you. The people who actually are selected to do the consultation or review your AIMS page um, will actually get paid for doing it. So there, the, there's an incentive to them. It, it, it's, uh, um, I don't know that it fully covers their time, uh, but uh, we, we wanted them to be excited about this beyond the noble mentoring uh, thing that drives much of what I think we do. Uh, and then uh, one level up from that are short-term sabbaticals, anything from one week to three months and you can apply for those, and all of this is available now. Uh, we have a pretty easy application uh, uh, um, that's all online. Uh, and so if you found a lab that you really wanted to work in uh, and learn a technique for, uh, so if you're interested, in, just as an example, in learning how to perform uh, electrical stimulation of a mouse or implant uh, stem cells, you could come to the University of Pittsburgh uh, and uh, um, and we would set you up with a lab where you would work. And once again, we provide some funding to you. And the host laboratory, as you can see here, um, will get $15,000 to support the effort that they have to put in and maybe some materials they might want to bring on board to help you learn. We broke our laboratories for this collaborative opportunities into kind of three cores. Um, cell therapeutics and tissue regeneration, which is a, a kind of your... Um, classic uh, um, uh, uh, regenerative medicine course. So what cells can we use? What tissue uh, scaffoldings can we use? Then um, what I like to think of is the central rehabilitation end of it, which is mechanotransductive methods. So it's all about if we, if you think of how a stretch works or strengthening works, we're, we're, we're doing something to the mechanical, the, the mechanobiology of the muscle when we exercise people, how does that impact the, the cells? And so we have a mechanoconstructive core. And then finally, you need biomarkers to know what you're doing. And we want specifically mechanosensitive biomarkers. And so that's our third core. And you know the intersection of that is improve stem cell function and improve uh, tissue regeneration. Uh, we have this matrix here which shows different labs. These are clickable links. Um, this crosses all of the institutions, um, uh, Mayo Clinic, University of Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Stanford, um, and UCSF. Uh, so all of their labs are listed in here. And so you can look at where your interests might lie, click on one of those labs, uh, and, and see if there might be a, way, a place where there would be um, some overlap. And, you know, uh, we're always interested in adding labs, and so that might be a possibility if you think there's unique expertise at your institutions uh, um, to become a part of, uh, of R3. And I'll talk about another opportunity related to regenerative rehabilitation in a little bit. 
Um, the other aspect is pilot funding. Uh, we did something unique with our pilot funding program this year. Um, that was uh, 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 something that Fabi wanted to try, which is uh, normally what you have to do for uh, uh, some submissions is submit a letter of intent. I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Uh, so you write a one or two page letter of intent, it's reviewed and they tell you whether they want you to submit. Instead of doing a letter of intent, we did a video of intent, a VOI. So we had people use their smartphone or the, the, uh, the um, video uh, built into their computer like what I'm using right now and uh, record, uh, uh, um, I think it was a five minute uh, um, presentation on what they would do with pilot funding. And then based on those videos of intent, we selected people to apply um, and we uh, just uh, finished the review of those applications um, this past week and we'll be making a decision. So it's too late for this year, but the great news is, is that we're gonna open this up like earlier next year. So the call for proposals is uh, uh, for our pilot funding program is likely to come out in uh, July, um, and and that'll be for the VOI component, and then we're likely to uh, close that sometime in the fall, uh, and and ask for a full submission shortly thereafter. So uh, this can range from ten to fifty thousand dollars. What's important is that it, it it cover the concepts of both regenerative medicine and rehabilitation. If it's just an exercise protocol without a stem cell or, or some regenerative component, it's less likely to be funded. If it's just stem cell without exercise, uh, um, it's less likely to be funded. I, you know, we talked to regenerative medicine researchers who plant stem cells, put the mouse in a cage, have never tracked the treadmill, um, how much they're running or force them to run in any way. And that's kind of what we're trying to change is let's look at the activity, maybe even create groups to look at um, how activity affects stem cell differentiation. Um, our last um, component of, the, uh, of this, besides just monitoring to make sure that we're doing everything right, is actually adding to the technology. Um, uh, and I'm not going to go into too much detail of this, but if you're interested in looking at the impact of stress and strain on muscle-derived stem cells or any stem cell, there's very limited equipment available out there to be able to do that. Um, right now, you can um, you can plate cells on a flexible membrane, and then there's machines that puff air underneath it, so it simulates a stretch. Uh, we were thinking that it would be great to get into a three-dimensional system. Uh, and so uh, Todd McDevitt, who's uh, at the Gladstone um, Institute, was part of our initial proposal, and he has a way to create three-dimensional constructs, uh, and then you can... Uh, um, those three-dimensional constructs can then, uh, you can apply forces to them uh, so that we can see, in, in, uh, um, as opposed to just in this single dimensional uh, or, or on a plate, how cells respond to stress and strain, we can actually see it um, in a three-dimensional construct. And so we're excited uh, to look at how uh, 3D loading of micro tissues uh, impacts uh, regenerative capacity because that's certainly what our rehabilitation therapeutics do. Um, and then our second um, uh, one uh, was proposed by Tom Rando, uh, who obviously is uh, uh, the co-PI on the study. And uh, his uh, work was on um, uh, looking at non-invasive uh, ways of assessing muscle stem cell response. Because if we can do that non-invasively, we can mechanically load. And so using uh, bioluminescence, he's come up with a way of uh, in vivo looking at a mouse um, and looking at how stem cells are responding and then specifically how they might respond to exercise. So uh, um, that those, and we're hoping those technologies will become available. Both of those labs, by the way, are available for sabbaticals. I mentioned um, much of uh, what we do in regenerative rehabilitation was built on this consortium and you can see the consortium uh, mem uh, members, which include all four of the partners in ART, but also Emory, um, and Steve has been involved in helping us get started from this from the beginning. You can see uh, the University of Virginia has joined Indiana University. We have uh, um, international membership in Kyoto, and we're actually getting kind of uh, new members all the time and uh, uh, that are helping to push this field and uh, support the conference that's going to be happening at Emory this coming year. And so if there's institutions that are interested, uh, uh, please let us know. I just wanted to put the first slide up again because it shows our website. 
It shows that we have an active Facebook page and YouTube channel, uh, and we'd like uh, to encourage as many people uh, to get on and, and be part of the conversation related to regenerative rehabilitation. So uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions uh, that, that you might have or comments. I have a question for you. Um, it seems pretty intuitive that for muscle, I guess the skeletal, the musculoskeletal system and even the CNS, that it, the exercise could enhance uh, regenerative techniques. Do you think it would be also true for something that's a little more peripheral like islet cell kind of work or in, in particular, I'm thinking about diabetes and, and some of the work to, to you know, yeah, you know, insulin productivity. Sure. Well, you know, the, the, it's an interesting thing because I the pancreas is probably a horrible example to use, right? Um, that I said of something that may be outside of our domain because, in fact, we all know that there's this strong interaction between diabetes um, and exercise, right? And so, why wouldn't if we were implanting um, uh, um, pancreatic stem cells? Why wouldn't we think that in order to make sure that they're getting the appropriate signaling exercise of the host. So this is not at a mechanobiology level. This is more at a physiology level where it would impact uh, the outcome. And so, the, and I also should say that it's not just about exercise. I think that there's, all, there's other therapeutics that as rehab professionals, we bring to the table such as ultrasound, uh, the uh, other things that might impact tissues at a local level. So I, I think that um, the limits of how Rehabilitation can impact regeneration are things that we don't we don't actually know where that limit is. I'm, I'm guessing that that in almost every domain we we have something to add. So, Mike, can you hear me? Yes. Can I, a question um, dealing with a proliferation of, of muscles based upon stem cell uh, dif differentiation? I, I think what I'm hearing is um, a great deal of, of excitement on the one hand, but uh, concerns appropriately about the implications for the nature of exercise in the presence of proliferation of new, new muscle cells. Does that imply that we exercise a muscle the same way we did if, that, if those were not new muscle cells? It's kind of one stream of consciousness. And I think it's a very fair question to ask. And the other is, you show a slide such as a proliferation of dystrophic muscle tissue. Is that necessarily a good thing? Um, just because one is producing more muscles in a more muscle fibers in a, in a dystrophic model, does that have functional implications? <laughs> so um, the the uh, I'm, I'm I, I you know my memory's so bad that I always remember the first part of the question. I forget <laughs> the first part of the question, so we'll start at the second one. Yeah. Uh, but so on the second part of the question, that you know I, I think what you're effectively highlighting, and I appreciate it, is that if we're not impacting function. Who cares? Um, and that's another place where rehab has so much to add to this field. In in that you know the the um, we, we if 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 all we're doing is showing in a petri dish or on a biopsy that we're getting uh, greater implantation of stem cells, but someone can't functionally perform an activity, then why do we care? And so the other thing that uh, that as rehab professionals we bring to the table is this ability to say, are we impacting participation at a global level and then function at a local level? I think that the question, if I remember the first question now related to is it the same type of exercise? Again, you know, great question. And the answer is, I don't think we know um, what, the, how to optimize that. And that's part of what we want to do. I, I think that, that we believe that you want to have a mechanical signal to the muscle that you want that, that, that in the absence of mechanical signaling, through use, through exercise, that stem cells might become fiber, they might differentiate into, into fibrous tissue, which isn't going to help. Um, I think that the uh, um, that we there needs to be a signal. How we best manifest that signal, what techniques, what exercises best do that is remains unknown. And then just because I think there was a hint of another question there, but I'm not sure, is that we always have to look out for safety. These are these stem cells are, in both of these examples, are locally applied. They're not going to do much in a muscular dystrophy model if what you're doing is applying a stem cell. If you have to inject every single muscle in a body, is that really going to work 
for a child with muscular dystrophy. So um, I think another place where we have something to add is if you're injecting something peripherally and you want it to seed and the muscles are getting the right signals, that that might actually help the in-migration and the implantation from a, uh, you know, an arterial or a venous injection to the right location, all of which is important. Yeah, I, I just uh, the reason I ask the question is I, I think as we talk to our colleagues in, in rehabilitation, whether it be physicians or, or therapists, the, the notion of providing a sense of excitement and challenge in, in, in the presence of these new technologies is, is, is terrific. But some of the pushback is the perception that some curriculum has to be compromised if this is going to be learned. And part of our challenge, I think, if we, in buying into this, is to convince our, our colleagues that perhaps some of our emphases and our embracing of new technologies and sciences may need to, uh, to require us to reapportion time that's been spent on other aspects of our education, which may not necessarily be as valid or productive. Now, I, I think that that's a, that, you know, that, that is a challenging um, endeavor for um, any field. Um, um, any any clinical field because there's always this pushback the, of what we've always done. There's the you know we could spend uh, with ten years filling medical school and physical therapy and occupational therapy curriculums um, with different courses uh, you know and and so if you're a hand therapist there's not enough hand therapy um, and if you're a a, um, a sports medicine uh, um, therapist there's not enough sports. Uh, I think that um, what's critical. Um, on some level is the scientific method, I think, and I know that that's been something you've long promoted, that we need to not just teach clinicians how to, uh, um, uh, how to treat something, we need to teach them how to evaluate the expanding literature. And I do think that, that when you're, if, you're, if you're giving a, tort, a, a course on exercise therapeutics, to talk about it uh, on a broad spectrum from you know, an athlete comes into your clinic or there's a person with a stroke sitting in front of you all the way till they, they have a stem cell diff in, in, implanted. How do you think of it differently? Only helps with the basic principles of exercise. And so uh, um, uh, I, uh, I, I'd love to, be, uh, I'd love to be part of the discussion. I think it's a, it's a great way to push. Thank you. Are there any other questions from uh, uh, distance? Uh, people. All right. Well, great. Thank you so much. Uh, a lot of great information. Very um, exciting topic, and we really appreciate your time. Uh, you're very welcome. Don't, uh, and we'll look for applications from the group. <laughs> We're counting on it. Thank you. All right. Have a great. Bye. Have bye. A great bye.